tonight and this month's program is entitled Conserving Reptiles and Amphibians, a main focus with Greg LeClaire, who is already on the screen there. Uh, Greg uh, has been paying attention to reptiles and amphibians for a long time, from an early age. Uh, according to the, the, all the research that's been done, he's uh, at the age of six, he received a, an encyclopedia, a nature encyclopedia, and he proceeded to devour it and moved on to other books and resources and proceeded to spend as much time as he could uh, outdoors in the woods looking for creatures and other parts of nature. And then eventually he got a little bigger and went on to Unity College and uh, studied wildlife biology there and uh, has continued his passion for reptiles and amphibians as we're gonna find out about tonight. Uh, we're delighted to have him here tonight. At the end, we will be having a Q&A session. So if uh, during the course of the program, if you have any questions, anything comes to mind, uh, just click on the Q&A button at the lower center of your screen and type it in there at any time during the program. And we'll do our best to get, a, get an answer out of Greg at the end of the program. So uh, thank you very much, Greg. It's all yours. Delighted to have you here. All right. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I'm very excited to be doing a presentation after, God, probably six months of not having done a presentation. So I'll get the, the screen share set up here. All right. Can you see that, Bill? Yes. All right, solid. So um, again, thank you everyone for coming today. I'm gonna to be talking to you about my favorite creatures on the planet, and that is the reptiles and amphibians. So again, my name is Greg, um, and if you have any questions, uh, please ask away. I'm not gonna be able to talk about everything that I want to tonight, uh, but if something piques your interest, please ask, because I, I would love to talk your ear off about it. So a bit about myself, you heard already, I've been in Maine my whole life. Um, I got my bachelor's degree in wildlife biology up at Unity, and currently I'm a master's student at the University of Maine, where I study ecology, uh, primarily the conservation of turtles. That's uh, my thesis currently. And of course, my interest is reptiles and amphibians, which we collectively refer to as herps. So the study of reptiles and amphibians is called herpetology. So that's where that term comes from. And I thought this, um, these two photos were actually pretty funny. When I was putting this together, I didn't realize the parallels between the two. Um, so that's me uh, about kindergarten age, holding one of my first captured garter snakes in Litchfield. And then this is me a year or two ago in Mississippi, handling an eight foot long coach whip snake as part of a research project. We're both wearing red, both handling snakes, both wearing hats. I thought it was um, very coincidental. So before we get too far into things, I want to make sure that we all know what reptiles and amphibians are, because while I'm sure many of us know, many of us uh, might have misconceptions or perhaps not know. So amphibians were the first vertebrates to come onto land in the evolutionary tree. So a vertebrate is an animal that has a backbone and you can feel that in your neck, that's your spine. So they were the first things with spines to crawl onto land. And because they were that bridge, they have this heavy reliance on water. So their skin is very thin, which allows water to enter their body very easily. In fact, frogs, they have what's called a drink patch where they sit in a puddle and can drink just by sitting in it. Um, but that also means they can dry out very quickly. So they can't be too far from water, otherwise they face some pretty big issues. Not only that, but they also depend on water for reproduction. So laying eggs in the water that are very jelly-like and loose, they would dry out very quickly without water. And in many cases, the young need water to survive in for weeks to months. So tadpoles, for example, need it to swim through as they develop into an adult frog. Uh, whereas salamanders, usually they look like just a miniature version of the adult salamander, but actually have gills. So they need to be breathing oxygen through the water. And they're all also called ectothermic, which that um, in more common terms is called cold-blooded. 
But when we say cold blooded, we don't mean that their blood is actually cold. We mean that they are actually the temperature of the environment around them. So this is a good and a bad thing as well. It's good because it saves tons of energy. Ectothermic animals don't need to eat several times a day. They could even potentially go weeks or months without eating. Whereas we need to eat three square meals a day in order to keep our metabolisms going and keep our body temperature up. But the downside to that is that they can't go into places that are too cold because they just can't provide the heat needed for that. So they're pretty limited in their ranges and when they can be active. Now, as for the types of amphibians out there, there are three major types, two of which we have in Maine. So we have frogs and salamanders, nine species of frogs, eight species of salamander, plus one that's been introduced, which sadly didn't find a place in my presentation today. But if you wanna learn about probably the kookiest uh, herpetology story Maine has, please ask about the introduced salamander species. Um, and then there's what's called the Sicilians, which are worm-like amphibians that only live in the tropics and we won't find them here. As for the reptiles, they came just after the amphibians and they were much better adapted to land than the amphibians were. So they have thicker scaly skin that can hold the water much better than the thin, very permeable skin of amphibians. And their eggs also have a hard shell. So it's usually kind of leathery and pliable, but it holds water, whereas the amphibian eggs are almost nothing but water with just like a little bit of stuff mixed in. And there are some that give live birth, and we'll talk about that a, uh, a little later, but most of them lay eggs. Again, they're all ectothermic, except for a few, like the leatherback sea turtle produces a little bit of heat for itself. And they are um, there are five different types of uh, reptiles out there, only two of which we have in Maine. So we have snakes and turtles. Uh, there are also lizards, crocodilians, and what's called a tuatara, which is a very lizard-like animal that only lives in New Zealand. However, it's more closely related to dinosaurs, as far as I understand it, than it is to lizards. So we have nine species of snake in Maine, plus one that's recently extirpated. Extirpation, if you're not familiar with the term, means that it's extinct in the area, but can be found elsewhere in the world. So no longer found in Maine. And as for turtles, it's a little bit more complicated. We have six species, plus one that's been introduced, plus one that is likely extirpated. Um, it's a bit wishy-washy because people release their pet turtles in the wild. So I wanna start you all off essentially where I started years ago. Uh, I'm gonna take you back to the early 2000s where I was about seven years old on a warm rainy night in spring. And you should be hearing frog audio here in just a second, so don't jump. So hopefully you just heard the sound of spring peepers, and that's my favorite sound of all time. And that was the backdrop for me for one of my first experiences with reptiles and amphibians, where my family and I were coming home from a family outing, and we're pulling into the driveway, it's raining outside, it's night, and we're walking up to our door, and we came across this fella. This is a big old female spotted salamander. She was full of eggs and headed to a local pool to mate. We'll talk about that in just a second. But spotted salamanders are amazing. And you can imagine what a seven-year-old thinks the first time they see one. And perhaps you remember that. And if you're anything like me, you were flipping rocks and logs everywhere you went looking for uh, salamanders. And I had never seen this before. And that's because, first of all, she was probably migrating in from somewhere outside of where I looked. But they also spend a huge chunk of their lives underground and much farther than just the surface where like you roll a log. Um, so this gal showed up and of course, you know, I'm amazed like this thing is huge and it's black and it's got bright yellow spots. And some amazing things I learned about this animal recently is the fact that this is the only photosynthetic vertebrate on the planet, which um, I know that might not sound too exciting to most people, but what that means is that this animal can actually turn sunlight into energy which no other vertebrate animal we know of can do that. So as far as we know, it only um, has that superpower when it's uh, a baby, so a tadpole of sorts, or a, a larvae rather. Um, and of course, as an adult, for an animal that only comes out at night and lives underground for almost its entire life, it wouldn't really be worth having this power to turn sunlight into food. But it's an amazing superpower nonetheless to help them grow faster as young. So. This spotted salamander was likely on the way to something that looks like this, which is a vernal pool. And these are amazing pieces of habitat that we have here in Maine. 
Vernal pools are a seasonal body of water where essentially they fill up with uh, snow and ice melt in the spring as well as rain. And then usually by about July or August are drying out. So basically it's just a puddle that lasts for a few months. And the fact that it doesn't last all year long means that fully aquatic animals can't last there. So things like fish, for example. So automatically this kicks out a bunch of other animals that they're competing with, be it for space or resources, or even just trying to avoid being eaten by, which fish would love to eat, you know, frogs or salamanders. But not only are these um, great spots to go, they're also biodiversity hotspots here in Maine. So not only are there species like salamanders and frogs using them to breed in, but uh, there's also what's called the fairy shrimp, which is an amazing little uh, animal about this big. If you've ever seen like sea monkeys or um, brine shrimp, that's essentially what they are. And they just like float around and have a, a year to live. But the cool thing is they'll lay their eggs in the soil and those eggs can last hundreds of years waiting for water to hit again. And uh, that could mean if you have a vernal pool in your backyard with fairy shrimp, those shrimp might have been laid in the 1500s or 1400s before um, Europeans even arrived on the continent. Uh, so very cool to have these around and they provide uh, plants usually a little bit earlier for herbivores, a great food source for things like raccoons, um, all around very important piece of habitat in uh, Maine. And if you look into a vernal pool at just the right time, you might catch a scene that looks a little bit like this, where there are a bunch of spotted salamanders swimming around like cute little spotted crocodiles. Um, but usually you won't find males and females in there at the same time. So males will show up first and leave little tiny what's called spermatophores, which are little white dots. Um, and that's essentially just a sperm packet for the female to come find later. So the females show up, and then they find the sperm packets and then they'll lay egg masses that look like this and they'll attach them to vegetation or sticks. And there are these cool little kidney shaped alien looking egg masses where um, some of them can be clear, some of them can be like a milky white like this one, and then others can be green, which is that start of that superpower of where it can photosynthesize. Um, so very cool. The color seems to depend on genetics as far as I understand. And the eggs themselves are also food for other animals as well. So this is a, a dragonfly nymph right here, starting to make a snack out of the egg jelly. Uh, so even the eggs are an important piece of the puzzle here. And the spotted salamander is not alone on these nights, which I'm sure many of you have noticed when it gets to a warm rainy night in spring, the um, area can be covered in amphibians moving. So you might see something like the red eft phase of the eastern newt moving about or the wood frog, which is another true vernal pool breeder, and we'll talk about them more later. Or the blue spotted salamander, which is an amazing species. Um, I could talk all day about their genetics if I had time, but um, ultimately their genomes are bigger than humans. They uh, interbreed with other species very easily. They have all female populations that are uh, cloning themselves. Um, and it's a species of concern here in Maine, and they're a little challenging to find. So if you do find them, um, kudos to you. And then, of course, there's the spring peeper that is just about everywhere on these nights. And these nights, because there's so much activity going on, we call them big nights. It's just a huge amount of activity going on. The conditions are just right for amphibians to move. And in a perfect world, an amphibian would move to its vernal pool, essentially like this, fairly straightforward, maybe having to climb over a rock or a log or dodge a predator or two, right? But in the modern world, what we're seeing more of is this. Very nice sports cars are running over our amphibians. And while it's not just sports cars, roads are a huge issue for migrating amphibians. And just to give you some context, there was a study in Canada where um, just studying a single segment of road over the course of four years, they counted 30,000 amphibians killed by cars. And um, to put that into another perspective for you, a, any given amphibian crossing the road will face about a 20% chance of getting hit by a car. That can increase if there is more traffic and also if the animal is larger and if it's slower. So something like a spotted salamander has a much higher chance of being hit by a car than something like a toad or a wood frog. Um, and we'll talk about that 100% mortality uh, actually right here because things like spotted salamanders, they're so large and slow, there's actually been a few spots where some declines have been noted in spotted salamander populations. It's typically more in like suburban Massachusetts where these things are being noted, but it is certainly a possibility for even like rural Maine if you get um, cars coming through at just the right time. 
And sadly, the more mobile these amphibians are, the more likely they're going to get hit by cars. So our vernal pool breeders are at higher risk than something like a bullfrog, where they just spend their entire life in a pond, never really having to leave. Even their babies might not leave to find a new territory. Whereas vernal pool breeders are crossing the road once to get to the pool, again to leave it, and then a third time where their babies are leaving the pool. Um, and that's assuming there's only one road to cross where there could be multiple potentially. So how do we go about reducing amphibian road deaths? Number one, the most obvious way would be to either reduce or um, more intelligently develop areas. So there are plenty of ways that are coming out now on how to develop in more harmony with nature. Um, but of course, slowing down development is huge for all species. Birds, I'm sure you're well aware of, are um, very well threatened by habitat destruction and uh, development. Um, but the other idea, there's multiple ideas out there, but the other idea that I want to present to you today is a conservation model that um, is probably out there in all sorts of different forms, but my form rhymes, so I like it more. It's the collect, protect, and connect model. And what I mean by this is step one, we have to collect data on where these migrations are happening. So uh, for one, where are there a lot of amphibians migrating? A species of concern? Is there significant mortality going on? Is there de uh, a declining population? And based on that information, we can designate areas to protect. And luckily, here in Maine, we have what's called the Maine Significant Vernal Pool Program, which essentially that means you can get a vernal pool certified as being significant and worthy of protection if it has a certain number of spotted salamander eggs, a certain number of wood frog eggs, any presence of blue spotted salamander, or any presence of fairy shrimp. So once it gets that uh, special designation, anytime there needs to be development within about 250 feet of that pool, there needs to be special consultation given to make sure that pool is not significantly impacted, which is excellent. However, protecting natural areas is only worth so much if we can't connect them. And um, there's several reasons for that. So migrating amphibians, obviously they're probably moving between natural areas and might have to cross over a road. But then also climate change is a big one, right? And uh, not just amphibians, but all sorts of species have to shift their home ranges to respond to the changing climate. Um, as well as genetics, there's amazing uh, studies out there that have shown that spotted salamanders and wood frogs have genetically distinct populations on either side of a road because they can't cross to breed with each other. Um, that's a pretty extreme example, but it does happen. And it's something that's well known in like uh, it's California or Nevada for like mountain lions and bighorn sheep. Um, it happens right here in Maine as well. So connecting these natural areas looks a lot like this. This is a, a salamander tunnel that uh, was the first of its kind in North America. That's in Amherst, Massachusetts. And essentially, a migrating amphibian will find this wall and hopefully follow it until it reaches the tunnel and it crosses through the tunnel until it reaches the other side safely. So it's pretty cool that there are tunnels specifically built for migrating amphibians. Um, whether or not they work seems to depend a lot on careful planning and design, um, but there are some that have been fairly effective, which I believe this one has been. But what I want to talk to you most about today is the collection part of this, because you can all participate in collecting the data through my citizen science project called The Big Night. Um, obviously referring to the nights where these amphibians move a lot, but essentially you get to go out on these big nights with your friends and family and collect data on amphibian migrations, which is tons of fun. I've been doing it since I was a kid. Um, and essentially you're collecting data again on where are they migrating, uh, where is their significant mortality going on, and all of this data gets contributed to planning in the future. Um, so potentially where would a salamander crossing go in the future? And when I say anybody can participate, I mean literally anybody. Um, if you are three or four years old, if you are 99 years old, if you're an active scientist or military or a student or uh, whatever you are, um, this is something that we're trying to make accessible to everybody. And we're actually doing what we can right now to make sure it's accessible to uh, different communities, especially anybody who feels like they might be separated from nature, especially you know within cities. Um, we want to be able to bring that to you, um, as well as people with disabilities. We're trying to find ways to make sure that this is accessible to them. So um, you can participate literally anywhere in the state. We have over 300 sites designated, and we put up new ones every year. 
So if you know of a new site that we haven't registered yet, you can always tell us where that site is and we'll put it there and you can go monitor it. So even if there's not one near you, you can make your own. And so far, since we started just two years ago, we're going on to our third season now. We have rescued uh, just over 1,700 amphibians and counted over 2,000. Um, and that's great, but we have big shoes to fill. There's another project in Keene, New Hampshire that just, uh, I can't re remember if it's rescued or recorded, uh, their 50,000th amphibian. They've been going since uh, the 2000s. But what was really cool this year is the fact that we were still able to um, keep the project going despite COVID because it was outside and we can maintain social distance and we were in small groups. Um, we were able to detect a just about a 50% decline in amphibian mortality because there were so many less cars on the road. Um, so that was really cool to see and something that we're actively trying to get published now. So if you're interested in joining, um, feel free to check us out on Facebook. That's the title of our group. We're working on getting a website, but for now, this is our main mode of communication. Um, obviously not much happening right now, but once springtime starts getting closer, you'll see things about where to find trainings for volunteers or like where to send your data or questions or cool pictures of what people find. So um, feel free to join up and I'll approve your request to join. So we're gonna hop onto the other side of the vernal pool and meet this gallant noble fellow who is also extremely awkward looking and awkward sounding. Um, this is the wood frog. And when I say awkward sounding, they sound more like chickens to me than they do actual frogs. They, they kind of cluck. Um, and though they be awkward, they be amazing. This is an unreal species of frog. It has the largest latitudinal range of any amphibian in the world. Um, it can be found as far south as Alabama and as far north as the Arctic Circle in Alaska. Um, and they owe that ability to the fact that they can actually freeze about 60% solid. Um, other frog species can do it as well, but I guess none do it as well as the wood frog. Uh, and that ability is actually being studied by NASA to learn about um, whether or not we can explore deep space by freezing ourselves to last long journeys. And besides being you know, really cool and being able to freeze solid, they also have amazing camouflage. I mean, you can see that they're um, very leaf colored and the fact that they're even leaf shaped is um, amazing camouflage but they even act like leaves when they feel threatened so if you were to poke one or get too close to one and they don't like it they'll kind of flatten themselves out like this guy does here um, and they'll actually flatten themselves out even a little bit more um, hoping that you think he's just a leaf and that you pass on i've likely passed hundreds of wood frogs in the woods that i've never noticed um, the only time I ever see them is when they actually hop through the woods or find them on a road like this guy, which the posture is good, but it is not a good place to, to pretend to be a leaf. So what I want to talk to you about today with wood frogs is an amazing study that was conducted by some uh, folks up at the University of Maine in Orono. Um, so this is going to be some findings from a study by Christine Hoffman, Tom Hastings, uh, Mac Hunter, and Aram Calhoun. So thank you all to um, to all those who I talked to about this project and are allowing me to talk about it for them. I was not involved in this project, so I'm just sharing their findings. And essentially what they wanted to study was how wood frogs move through the environment to um, reach their upland habitats for like the summer uh, and winter, and then how they reach their vernal pools, and especially in the context of a suburban environment. Um, so what they did was they captured a bunch of wood frogs and they attached these radio transmitters to them with a belt. So there's a belt that goes around his waist here. Um, this yellow piece of flashing is just to make it easier to find them on nights when they're tracking them. So that will give a signal that they can track and follow to see where these guys move. And this is a map of one of their study areas. This is off of Mount Hope Avenue in Bangor. And you can see uh, this is where they captured all of the amphibians. I, I hope you can uh, see my uh, mouse here in this corner. Uh, but that's the vernal pool where they were all uh, tagged and they tracked them as they migrated from the pool back up to their upland home ranges for the rest of the year. And you can see they all move generally in the same direction, all heading to this little tiny patch of woods right here. And while you can't see the entire picture, this is really a small patch of woods. Um, it really would only take like one more offshoot of a street or a few more houses to completely decimate what's left of this wood frog habitat. Um, and I want to talk to you specifically about a few of these journeys here. Um, so a few wood frogs will make this entire journey in a night. And by the way, um, apparently 
The size of the wood frog and the distance it travels is apparently comparable to that of uh, the wildebeest, wildebeest migration of the Serengeti. Um, so you have an amazing migration going on right under your nose, possibly right through your yard that you just might not always be cognizant of. Um, but so to talk about a few of these individuals, a few of them um, obviously made this in a straight shot. So like this yellow guy here, probably one or two nights had a, had a pretty quick travel. But most of them spent a lot of time um, hunkering down in people's yards and waiting for better conditions to move. Um, and we'll talk about what made a good yard in a second, but we can talk about what made a bad yard first. And you can see that not every line made it. And that's because the frog died on its way. So for example, this light green one here, um, I don't know the specific story on this individual, but I do know that several individuals were dead because of cats. And I'm sure that um, you guys being in the Audubon Society know very well how bad cats are for wildlife when they're outdoors, um, killing billions and billions of animals per year. Frogs are part of that. Um, and then many also died under the blades of lawnmowers because they stopped in yards that didn't have appropriate habitat for them to hang out in. Uh, so we're very exposed and ended up getting nailed by a lawnmower. So this one could have been a lawnmower, it could have been a cat, I'm not entirely sure. But the one that I do know is this red line right here that zigzags and ends up in this person's pool. I don't know why you would have your pool uncovered in early April in Maine, but this person apparently did. And uh, this frog ended up landing in the pool, not being able to escape, and then likely either drowning um, or more likely succumbing to chemical poisoning from the chlorine in the pool. So if you have pools, keep them covered until April is over. I don't foresee anybody swimming in April anyway, but um, just for the sake of the frogs and salamanders, keep it covered. Okay, so um, as for the ones that had the uh, several day migrations and the yards they stopped in, what made the difference for them was whether or not people had planted shrubs in their yard. Because shrubs, as it turns out, are amazing pieces of stopover habitat for migrating amphibians because they hold moisture super well, they're super well shaded, so they're not gonna dry out or overheat anytime soon, but they're also very well protected from things like predators and lawn mowers and you know, all sorts of other things going on. And they could wait there relatively safely until conditions were good to move again. So until the next night, which might've been a rainy night, which might've been a week away or a days away. So plant shrubs, all of these backyards were once wildlife habitat. And you can turn it into wildlife habitat again super easily. I mean, you've probably heard about planting native plants in your yard for birds. Same idea goes for herps. You can plant um, shrubs or other species that will help provide shelter for things like migrating amphibians. Another consideration I want you to be aware of is that if you have pools on your property, there are special things you can do to make sure that pool stays healthy. So this is not a vernal pool, or at least most likely not, but it is very near a significant piece of amphibian history in Maine. Um, essentially, uh, we'll talk about the important piece in a second, but if you have a pool and you expose it by removing all the trees and shrubs around the edges, you have given it more exposure to the sun, so it's gonna dry out faster and also be much warmer. For one, that's gonna attract other species like bullfrogs and green frogs, which is fine, but then you're going to have overcrowding and that plus the heat means disease transfer is going to be crazy. So in 2013, there was a recorded die off of amphibians at a pond in Brunswick, very similar to the one I just showed you, where in 24 hours, 200,000 frogs were recorded to die. That's through a disease called ronavirus. It's one of the deadliest wildlife diseases on the planet. It doesn't affect people, so don't get too concerned, but um, be concerned for the amphibians. Um, this is a natural thing, by the way, sometimes you just get disease outbreaks at ponds like this, but if we were to start doing this to our vernal pools, making them warm and attracting other species and overcrowding them, uh, this would be something I would consider more of a problem. Um, right now, amphibians can handle die-offs every now and then, uh, but if we start exposing all of our vernal pools and not taking proper care of them, this could actually become a major issue. So um, we are about halfway through the presentation now. We are switching gears to the reptiles and we're actually gonna talk about my favorite animals on the planet, which are the turtles. And I don't know if you can actually see, but I'm wearing a turtle shirt right now uh, for one of my research projects that I've been involved in. Um, and turtles, as amazing as they are, they are one of the most threatened groups of animals on the planet. So over half of them are threatened with extinction in some way, shape or form or are 
already extinct in the wild or extinct in general since we found them. And uh, if you want to know what threatens turtles, the answer is essentially all of the above. Um, if we're talking about Maine specifically, habitat loss is something that we need to be cognizant of for something like the spotted turtle. This is a beautiful species mostly found in the southern corner of the state that is limited to ephemeral wetlands and peat bogs, which are a little bit in short supply towards that end of the state. Um, so you can easily wipe out a spotted turtle population just by developing it with like a single plant or um, factory or whatever, you know, might be de uh, developing in the area. Um, these are habitat specialists, whereas something like a painted turtle on the right is a generalist and will really use just about anything. Habitat destruction is not as big of a deal for them. But then there's also things to worry about like roads and over predation and uh, even people collecting them, which we'll talk about in a second. Uh, but the reason that they're so easily endangered by everything is the fact that they have extremely long life histories where it can take them anywhere between five and 18 years to become reproductively active. Uh, so for example, snapping turtles and wood turtles like this species here, um, it can take them anywhere between like 15 to 18 years in the state to become reproductively active. So if you take out one adult from a population, it can take years, possibly a decade or more for another turtle to show up to take that turtle's place. Um, and that's especially concerning when you consider the fact that uh, anywhere between 95% and 99% of every year's babies don't make it through their first year. Um, they get eaten by predators, either as eggs or as babies, they get hit by cars, they get lost on their way. Um, there's just so many things that can go wrong for a baby turtle. And for it to make it through that first year is a huge leap. And then to make it through 17 more, I mean, there's just so much that a turtle has to go through in order to survive. So it's super easy to make a turtle population plummet. So they're sensitive to turtles getting taken out of the population, but they're also sensitive to like people coming in as well. So for example, again, the wood turtle, um, there have been studies that have shown that just having light recreation like canoeists and uh, fishermen was enough to cause wood turtles to say, I'm out of here, I'm gonna go find another place to go. Not every species is like that, but um, usually our species of concern like the wood turtle uh, are quite sensitive. Now, Add the fact that everybody loves them to a point that it's a problem and turtles are really in trouble. So for example, animals love them for food. Um, there are sites that I've seen during my research where an entire year's worth of young were eaten in a night because of a single skunk. That has happened three years in a row at a single site for wood turtles. It's about a dozen uh, nests that the skunk hits and it's like the night that they're laid that skunk shows up and eats all of them. Um, so animals love them for that reason, but then people love them also for food, but also as pets. And we'll talk about that in just a second. Um, but first, I want to, before we get too far into talking about um, people loving turtles too much, I want to show you all how to help turtles in roads, because roads are another huge issue for these guys. And usually when you see a turtle in a road, which I'm sure many of you have, you're looking at a breeding aged female looking for a place to lay her eggs. You can imagine the just impact that has when a turtle gets hit. Um, so hopefully this video I put together a year ago is instructional and informative for you. Um, and hopefully you can hear it as well. So we'll just watch it for a minute or two and learn about how to help snapping turtles cross the road. Now, to move a snapping turtle, the best way to do it that I like to tell people, turtles have these little handlebars right here above the back legs and you can pick them up Oh, sorry. Like so, and move them. But if you have a snapping turtle that's really big, like this one, that can be really hard on your wrists. So the other way I like to tell people is to lift up the back tail like this, slide your hand under the belly, and there you go. You have like a nice little turtle platter that you can rest against your body. Now some safety tips, because snapping turtles can obviously bite very hard. You do not want to go past the midpoint on the shell right here if you do. You could be in the bite zone. Um, and of course, that wouldn't be something that you want. It's not something the turtle wants. So just don't go past the half point of the shell. Their head can come very far around as you can see right there. So we're gonna go ahead and move this girl. We're gonna move her across the street. We wanna look out for our safety first. There are fast moving cars here. So we pulled off on the side of the road with our blinkers on where cars can see us. And I'm gonna look both ways before crossing. And one thing to keep in mind, we're not gonna spin this turtle around make sure that she's facing the same direction that she was traveling. So she was headed this way. Let's go ahead and move her. 
right, hey, we got one car coming, so we'll wait. I know, sweetheart, look at you. You are a big turtle. Another thing to keep in mind, snapping turtles are not gonna be thankful for what you do for them. They're gonna think you're a predator trying to eat them. So she's been scratching me this whole time. My knuckles are bleeding, but it's all worth it to save a turtle. She can lay up to 50 eggs. So saving one, you might be saving 50. So there's a swamp over here. She's gonna be on her way. And we're gonna leave her be and say good luck to her. And that is how you help a snapping turtle across the road. Okay, uh, hopefully you are all able to hear and see that well. And if you have any questions about how to move a snapping turtle, I'm happy to demonstrate again. Uh, but if you do want to get more involved with helping turtles in roads, there's actually a great citizen science project with Maine Audubon. So hopefully you've heard about it. Um, it's the Maine Turtle Roadkill Survey. So it works very similar to Big Night where you adopt a site to uh, essentially patrol and look for turtles. And um, when you do find them, you could probably help them. But most, um, perhaps most importantly, record the fact that there are turtle crossings going on. Um, so if you want to learn more about it, check it out on their website. I don't want to accidentally tell you something wrong about it, so I'm not going to go into too much detail here. So the most important piece, though, I keep referencing that I'm going to talk about people loving turtles too much, and um, it, we're going to get into that now through this species, which is, again, the wood turtle. I'm sorry I'm putting so much emphasis on this species, but I've been working for it for, uh, with it for about five years now, so it's hard for me to avoid this species. Uh, but this is an amazing animal. Uh, most of you probably haven't seen this species in the wild before. I certainly wouldn't have if I was, wasn't doing research on it. Uh, it took me about a year and a half to find my first wood turtle after searching for state surveys. Um, amazing species in so many ways. I mean, look at how beautiful this animal is. It's got a sculpted shell that looks like it's made out of wood with gold leaf inlays. And then their skin is this bright orange with this amazing golden eye iris here, um, and not to mention a personality to match the color. I mean, every wood turtle seems to have its own uh, little way of behaving. Some are really sassy and others are very calm, uh, but they're also extremely intelligent and in fact are regarded as perhaps one of the most intelligent reptiles on the planet. They can navigate mazes better than rats. They have an uncanny ability to find their way around and they might even be able to recognize things like schedules, maybe even people um, there's all sorts of cool pieces about wood turtles that just make them fascinating. Um, and this is a habitat specialist. You will only find them in slow moving sandy or gravelly bottom streams in Maine uh, with a lot of woodland cover around the stream. So all of these things come together to make them almost too valuable. In fact, they're valued as pets through uh, wildlife trade, be it legal or more commonly for the species illegal. So the illegal wildlife trade is a huge problem for wildlife worldwide. And usually when we think of uh, illegal wildlife trade, we're thinking of like rhinos for their horns and elephants for their ivory. Um, but it occurs here in the United States as well, including here in Maine. So for example, moose meat, uh, bear gall bladders, those are things that have been harvested from Maine as well as turtles. So this is the third largest illegal industry in the world, only behind illegal, dr uh, illegal drugs and illegal guns. Um, potentially on par with uh, human trafficking. And this can take place um, as either living animals or dead animals slash their parts. Uh, living animals are usually more for pets, occasionally for food, whereas their parts are uh, usually show pieces or uh, used in traditional medicines. Um, so there's all sorts of uh, functionalities of the illegal wildlife trade. And just to give you an idea of how big of an issue this is just for turtles in the Eastern United States, I'm gonna run you through a few recent incidences from the past few years. New York, uh, nearly 300 threatened and endangered turtles plus 20 boxes of their eggs were seized. Uh, the Jersey Shore, um, over 3,000 uh, diamondback terrapins, a listed species were seized from a guy who was a writer or a therapist, I can't remember. Um, he would collect them while he would go on runs. Uh, State College, Pennsylvania, a student was to make about uh, four or five times his tuition costs by selling 80 turtles to an Asian market. Um, South Carolina, there was a major ring that was busted with over 200 turtles on hand. Florida, over 4,000 turtles seized on hand. And then this one is really interesting. In Ontario, there was a, a scientist who published the location of their study population. And there was a 70% decline in that population after they published that data. 
And so they're guessing that because they published that location, uh, poachers got a handle of it and went and cleaned out that population to sell them in the pet trade. So um, if you work with threatened and endangered species, please be cognizant of um, publishing that information online. Um, we make everybody sign legal documents to say they won't share location information anytime they come out on the project with us. Um, and if they do, we have the legal ability to sue them because they signed a, a, a paper saying that they wouldn't do that. Um, so please uh, be aware of that if you are involved with threatened and endangered species. Now, wood turtles specifically, um, there were over 40 that were being sold on the Portland Old Port, um, both for food and pets back in the 90s. And the year after, there was 50 confiscated um, that made it all the way down to Virginia that were harvested up here in Maine, all being sold as pets. And truth be told, there's probably more going on under our noses that we're not aware of, um, hopefully in smaller sizes, like I mentioned before. I mean, a single turtle or two turtles being taken from a population can be catastrophic. I can't imagine what 50 or 40 turtles being taken would have done to a population. Um, and just to give you some context too of um, things I've seen in person, uh, every couple of months, the Manchester or New, uh, New England Reptile Expo occurs in Manchester, New Hampshire. New Hampshire is um, a bit of a wild west when it comes to wild animal laws. So you can own a lot more exotic species in New Hampshire. Whereas states like Maine and Massachusetts, there's very little you can own. So people usually leave the states that they um, are living in to go to these expos in New Hampshire to pick up a variety of exotic species that you couldn't get anywhere else. So the pancake tortoise, which is this species that you're seeing here, was being sold for $800 a pop. And this is a critically endangered species from Kenya with their primary threat being illegal wildlife trade, collection for the pet trade, and they only produce one to two eggs per year. There are no known captive breeding populations that are pumping out enough uh, tortoises to keep the pet trade satisfied. Not to mention, you can also count the number of rings on these tortoises' shells to get an age estimate. And this is probably, you know, a decade or two old turtle. Um, so the fact that somebody potentially raised three of these turtles uh, just in their backyard and then decided to sell them, not very likely. Um, and they do have varying ages too. Like this guy looks younger, whereas this guy looks a little bit older. Um, that's another sign that these are probably wild caught individuals. And there was actually another vendor who was selling uh, more pancake tortoises at this event. And I had never seen them at a, an expo before. The alligator snapping turtle also uh, seems to regularly make appearances at these expos. So this is a species that's being propo uh, proposed for listing under the Endangered Species Act here in the United States because of over collection for meat and pet trade. This is the second largest freshwater turtle in the world, usually coming in at about 150 pounds and the shell being uh, probably about yay big by the time that they finish growing. Um, I know of nobody who can properly care for a turtle that big in their own backyards or in their homes. Um, I can't believe they sell these guys and not to mention, every time I see them, I always ask the vendor, is that wild caught or is that captive bred? Guess what? It's always wild caught. And I can't believe they even tell me that, but they do. Um, so these animals are being pulled when they're potentially declining steeply due to collection and being sold as pets to people that probably can't feed them the proper diet or probably can't give them proper lighting. So they're going to develop a liver disease or calcium deficiency and have a short life. It's uh, a sad situation. And just another photo of all the lizards being sold at these. Um, as far as I know, these are all legal species, but just to give you an idea of quantity, and then an idea of money too for species that are also legal. These are all ball pythons, but um, $900 for this guy, uh, looks like $6,000 for the one back here. I mean, there's just so much money involved in the reptile trade. You can start to understand like why people get involved in it, but why we also have to um, start stepping up to it as well. This species of lizard is the Chinese cave gecko, and it went extinct in the wild almost as soon as it was discovered and described because reptile enthusiasts love to collect what is new and own what is new. Um, so almost as soon as it was described in science, it went extinct in the wild, which is a pretty sad story. Very popular in pet trade, doing very well. You can get them without much concern. Even at Petco, you can get them. Um, but a sad story for the species nonetheless. So how do we prevent poaching? Um, number one, report anything suspicious, and that would be to either Inland Fisheries and Wildlife here in the state of Maine or to US Fish and Wildlife Service, so a federal agency. 
But the most important thing is to be a responsible pet owner. So first of all, know what you're buying. Is this animal endangered in any states? Is collection a threat to it? Um, is it even legal to own in my state? And you can find out for Maine, there's a list of species that you're allowed to own. It's called the unrestricted species list. So Google that up and you'll find it. Um, but also be aware of fake advertisements. People very commonly sell animals as captive bred when they're actually wild caught. So just keep that in mind. And the other important thing is that we need to encourage people to behave properly with wildlife, um, especially that we, there's so much power to do this through social media. Um, so if you're interacting with an animal a lot and handling it a lot and showing that like the only way to connect with an animal is by holding it, other people are gonna think the same thing. Um, and also too, like if you ever traveled abroad and took a picture with like a tiger cub at a, like a roadside attraction or something, those are likely animals that are involved in illegal wildlife trade and going to um, some sort of vendor like that only fuels uh, the continuance of illegal wildlife trade because they got to replace that with another tiger cub at some point so they got to find another tiger to exploit and yada yada so uh, just be smart about it and to give you some actual scientific uh, proof that this is a thing um, this is a study that was done in 2011 where they photoshopped a uh, chimpanzee onto different backgrounds. So nothing or in an office or in a jungle, or sorry, in a zoo or in a jungle and either with or without a shirt or with or without a person. And they found that um, anytime it was in a building or wearing a shirt or uh, with a person, people were much more likely to think chimpanzees made good pets. Whereas if they were in a zoo or by itself or not wearing a shirt or in the jungle, they were much more likely to think that it was either endangered or not a good pet. Um, so how we represent wildlife really matters. And that will actually come up again later. And that's gonna come up in the snakes. So we're at the end of our presentation now, hopefully I'm not going too far uh, or too close to time, but snakes are understandably one of the most um, controversial groups of reptiles out there, perhaps one of the most controversial groups of animals on the planet. So if you have a phobia of snakes, that is totally fine with me. My own mother has a terrible phobia, which I believe my mom is in the audience today. And the technique that works for her, which I think is a great technique, is to name the snake as soon as you see it. So if you're easily jumped and startled by snakes, like you lift something up and there's a snake, just be like, Penelope. And suddenly that assigns it an identity and personality and you start um, connecting with it a little bit more. And I'm hoping that's something that you can all do by the end of this presentation. So for snakes in Maine, we have nine species and none of them are significantly venomous to people, um, at least currently. So one species we did have was venomous to people, um, but we do have um, venomous species in the state that are not harmful to people. So they use that venom for insects and we'll talk about that animal in a second, uh, but you have nothing to worry about as far as bites here in the state. And a few important notes about snake behavior. One, there are no aggressive snakes in the world. However, there are defensive snakes. So there are, are no snakes that I know of that would willingly chase a person thinking that's a good idea. Um, snakes simply don't do that. Um, you're many times this animal's size and a swift blow to the head would kill it. So charging when you're an inch off the ground towards a thing that it could look hundreds of feet tall to it um, makes no sense at all. So usually what's happening is you are either in their way and they are trying to get to safety behind you or they just can't see where they're going. And that's often the case as well. Don't forget, these animals are right on the ground. So it's sometimes hard to know what you're doing. Um, so some snakes might try to bite or try to um, give you some warnings if you do handle them. So um, if you are pushing your luck, then you're, you're in the snake's territory at that point. But the other important piece to know is that snakes, of course, have their place in our environment. So a lot of people will say snakes are great for um, pest control. And while I agree, I would like to at least give you the disclaimer that the scientific evidence for that is actually not as big as you might think. Uh, that's because snakes really can't eat that much. They eat like one mouse a week and they're good. Um, so there's only so much control a snake can do. But if you get a bunch of snakes, especially working in tandem with like hawks and foxes and other species, you get a great um, puzzle working together to uh, control pests. Now, species like these little guys here, these are full grown red belly snakes. They're actually both pregnant mamas. Um, they are a wonderful species to have in your garden. They love eating things like slugs and ants, so they can be great for protecting your plants. Um, and not to mention, snakes are great food for other species, especially things like birds. So they're a great source of protein, 
Um, and one really cool thing I learned about is that snakes are actually even good seed dispersers because they eat animals that eat seeds. And then when they poop that animal out, they leave the seeds with it and leave the seeds in a new spot that they might have otherwise never gotten to. Um, so all sorts of weird, cool ways that snakes might work in our environment that we never thought of. And just to introduce you to a few of our snake species we have in the state, we have the common garter snake, which is probably the most uh, commonly encountered species that we have here. Um, again, this is a species that would rather run away than cause you any harm, but if you do pick them up, expect to get a smelly musk on your hands. Um, but a very cool species that comes in different patterns here. It could be checkered, it could be stripey, it could be brown, it can be black, it can be blue even. Um, all sorts of cool colors for this species. But the smooth green snake, I think, is my favorite in the beauty contest. Um, just a gorgeous emerald uh, green color. And they're actually sadly in decline throughout the range, probably because of habitat destruction and pesticide application. We only find them in wet meadows. Um, typically. Um, so if you do have uh, green snakes, um, you probably have a pretty important piece of habitat that you should try to keep that way. Um, very cool species, also loves to eat insects. Ribbon snake is an actual species of concern here in the state, um, and I'm sure many of you are looking at this like, oh, I've seen a ribbon snake before, but I'd be willing to bet that you're actually thinking of garter snakes because they have a very similar stripey pattern. Uh, but the way to identify them from a garter snake is this little white scale in front of the eye. Um, that is the identifying mark for this species. So if you do happen to get one that's posing very nicely like this individual or even have it in hand, you look for that scale and you, if you see it, you've got a species of concern in your hand and that's very cool. Um, they're also a habitat specialist, usually hanging around swampy areas and also wet meadows. Black racer is our only endangered snake in the state, and it is only found in the southwestern corner, um, especially in the Sanford area, as far as I understand anyway, Sanford Wells. And so they like um, sandy shrubby habitats and are at the very northern edge of their range here in Maine. So that's why they're endangered. They're just limited um, because they don't have much habitat to go to, and they're just so far north that things are getting a bit too cold for them. Uh, but this is uh, our largest snake species, so lengthwise, it's a pretty big fellow. It's a couple feet long, um, and that might freak people out seeing a big black snake, but it's called a racer for a reason because it loves to run away from things. There's a, a great herpetology saying. Um, there's another species that looks just like this called the rat snake. It's also a long black snake, and the saying is, if you see a long black snake and go to pick it up, if it's still there, it's a rat snake. If it's not there, it's a racer. So um, no worries about encountering racers and having um, any issues with them. If you do pick them up, if you actually get to catch one, I hear they do get a little bit bitey, uh, but otherwise nothing to worry about. And the ringneck snake is uh, one of those venomous species I was talking about. So this is another very small species in the state and just a real pleasure to have around. They got a beautiful like orangey yellow belly that's not showing here that they'll show to predators as a warning sign. Um, and though they are venomous, and though I have been bitten by them, I have never had any issue with um, a ring neck bite. So you really got nothing to worry about with this species. And again, this is a slug eater and an anteater species. So great to have around for controlling the insects. But the species that I wanna to talk to you most about is actually the species that we no longer have in the state. And that is the timber rattlesnake. This is probably up there as one of the most controversial main animals, like up there with mountain lions. Like everyone's like, oh, I've seen a mountain lion. Like everyone's done the same thing with timber rattlesnakes. Like I, I hear so many stories of seeing timber rattlesnakes in Maine when they haven't been here for about 150 years. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but this is indeed a venomous species. And the thing about venomous species, uh, especially rattlesnakes, is that uh, venom is a very costly thing to produce. And it's primarily for catching food, not for fending off stupid people. So they're gonna give you as many warnings as possible uh, to tell you to back off and give them space before they deliver a bite. Um, so they'll usually coil themselves up into a defensive position similar to uh, what this snake might be doing here, and they'll rattle that tail. So everyone has hopefully heard what a rattlesnake rattle sounds like, be it through TV or in person. Um, so that's warning number one. Number two is this posture. And number three, if they actually deliver a bite to you, they might not even inject venom. It, it's what's called a dry bite. And that's because, again, venom takes so much time and energy to make, they don't want to waste it on a person. Um, but sometimes they do indeed inject venom, and it's uh, not a pretty story. 
Um, and people are concerned that they're just gonna be like walking through the woods and suddenly get bit by a rattlesnake. And I, I just wanna say that I have known many a biologist who has accidentally stepped on rattlesnakes or like been climbing up a cliffside and put their hand directly onto a rattlesnake and not even gotten a, a rattle shake or a bite. Um, and that's because you surprised the snake, it didn't have a chance to warn you and it doesn't know how to react quite yet. If you stay there, you're probably gonna get a bite, but if you give it its space as quickly as possible, you'll be fine. And just to give you some context, the vast majority of venomous snake bites in the United States are in guys about my age and a little bit younger who are drunk and they're almost always on the hand. So if that gives you any idea as to uh, who actually gets bitten by snakes, um, hopefully that means that you're gonna be okay. So rattlesnakes are a very long lived species, much like turtles. It takes them about 10 years to actually get to sexual maturity. And again, they don't get that much energy very quickly. They're a very slow moving animal and they are an ambush predator. So they're not out looking for prey. And the fact that they get so little energy from their environment means that it can take them about five years to actually get up enough energy to give birth. Um, so if you're looking at a, a population of animals where they're only breeding every five years and only producing a few young per female, um, and all those young are getting picked off by things like birds and roads, um, there's just so many things that a rattlesnake has to look out for. And it's not hard to imagine how these populations can decline so fast. So um, I want to show you a really cool thing just to hopefully pull on your heartstrings a little bit about rattlesnakes. Um, they are fantastic parents. In fact, they were the only reptile parents in the world. Um, the female will stay with her young for a few days to kind of show them the ropes of being a rattlesnake. Um, this is a time-lapse video of a rattlesnake family in Arizona of a different species, but it is very similar to what we would have seen here in Maine if the species still existed. Um, but essentially, the reason that we think that they are um, parents as compared to like other snake species or lizards or turtles where they don't have any parental care at all is again the fact that they're putting so much time and energy into these babies that they want to make sure that they raise them right. Um, so this is the mother right here, the big black individual and the little spotty ones are her babies. So she is going to spend a few days with them to make sure that they're protected and then also teach them how to essentially how to rattlesnake. Um, so they're going to follow her cues to know when it's time to go bask in the sun and get some heat and then when to run back in the den to avoid danger. But perhaps the most important piece here is that they're getting to know each other. And what I mean by that is that they're learning each other's scents so they can track each other um, later in the year when it's time to go into their dens for winter and wait until spring. They can follow each other's scent trails to these safe spots, especially moms, because mom knows where to go for winter and the babies don't yet. So they're going to follow her to those denning sites to make sure that they survive through the winter because that's a huge source of mortality for rattlesnakes. If they can't find a good place to go, then they're too. So um, that was a pretty cool thing I came across and hopefully that gives you some new perspective on rattlesnakes. Um, and as far as rattlesnakes today, they are um, extirpated from the state as of about 1850 was the last known recorded individual. It seems like they went through most of the southwestern section of the state, right up to about the Sebago Lakes region and possibly as far east as Camden, um, but really anywhere there were mountains with uh, rocky slopes, that was about the best place that you could find a timber rattlesnake in Maine. And despite the best efforts by biologists and hobbyists all over the world that come to Maine to like try to be the one to find the timber rattlesnake um, in the best habitats, there have been no confirmed timber rattlesnakes, very sadly. So this is what the range looks like today. Um, and they do exist elsewhere in New England, including in New Hampshire. And um, I often hear that like, well, if they exist in New Hampshire, like are they just gonna turn around at the main border? Like they, you know, that's a joke that like we hear a lot in the wildlife world is like, oh, they must turn around at the border. Um, well, the thing is the remaining 20 snakes or so in New Hampshire are in the southwesternmost corner of the state. And the likelihood of one of those individuals feeling enough pressure to leave its home range is very low. There's just so little pressure from so few snakes, but let's say one does. It needs to cross probably hundreds of roads and water bodies and other challenges, avoiding predators and uh, cars. Um, and eventually if it survives all of that magically and makes it to the main border, the odds of it being detected by a Mainer are probably less than a percent. So. Um, Assuming that a snake even makes it here, the odds of somebody actually finding it are extremely low. So um, the most 
uh, populated states in New England is going to be Massachusetts. There's also quite a few in Connecticut as well as Vermont. However, it is also extirpated from Rhode Island and the numbers are still decreasing. So it's possible that in time, this might not even be a species we find in New England anymore. Now, when people say they saw a rattlesnake, typically this is the culprit. This is a milk snake. Um, and you can see it's got some bold patterning and also this somewhat um, strong posture, right? It looks a little intimidating. Not only that, but it actually behaves a lot like a rattlesnake. So this is one I recorded in Thorndike just this past spring. Check out the tail. They rattle it just like a rattlesnake does. And while it doesn't um, audibly rattle, it still apparently looks intimidating enough that this is a behavior that the animal has learned. Um, milk snakes everywhere do it. So apparently it's just a, a good behavior to have to tell predators like, hey, back off, I am dangerous, which milk snakes are not dangerous. Um, she's obviously a little bit ticked off because um, I'm filming her and I'm also in the way of where she was trying to go, which was some woods behind me. Um, and you probably saw she like advanced towards me a little bit. And I think that's when people think they're about to get chased. But again, she was trying to get to safety, which was on the other side of me. So um, right after this, I moved out of her way and let her through. So what happened to the timber in Maine? Well, um, while some habitat destruction probably uh, contributed to the timber rattlesnake extirpation, the biggest issue was the fact that there was intentional persecution. So people going out and killing snakes whenever they could. Um, anytime they found a snake, they were killing it. So that was a big piece. And then there, there was also killing snakes for like snake oil, um, which was a, a commodity back in the day, apparently. Um, but fear it was this driving force that drove this species out of our state and is driving it through um, out of New England. So um, it, it's a, another sad story for our herbs. And that is still a fear that remains with us today. I mean, people haven't gotten any less afraid of snakes, it seems. Um, so for example, like when I think like, is there a future for the rattlesnake in Maine? Um, I'm thinking probably not because people haven't grown out of this fear of snakes. And just to give you a modern example, in Massachusetts um, where they are doing relatively well compared to other states, um, they were hoping to introduce a small population of them to an island in the middle of Quabbin Reservoir, which is off limits to people. Um, Quabbin Reservoir is the water source for Boston. So you can imagine how much people started freaking out when they started thinking about the fact that rattlesnakes could be swimming through their drinking water. And then there were things like people were getting worried of rattlesnakes coming up through their toilets, uh, coming through their sinks, which is just going to be impossible. And then people thinking venom was going to be like injected into their drinking water. And then they would drink the venom and die, which um, as far as I understand, you can actually drink rattlesnake venom and be okay. Um, it's a hemotoxin and has to come in contact with your bloodstream. Um, so if you digest it, apparently it's fine. Don't take me up on that. Don't go drinking rattlesnake venom. But those were the, the pieces of misinformation and the fear that made this project impossible. And sadly, it's been scrapped. And that could have been a nail in the coffin for timber rattlesnakes in Massachusetts. So um, this is a lesson to learn for us. Informed opinions matter. And I'm, I'm probably preaching to the choir here. You all know how important it is to be intelligent and know what you're talking about. Um, but it can really dictate how a species survives in the world or if it even makes it. Like our opinions day to day are judging what species are getting funding, what species are getting legal protection, and we're showing others what we care about. So we're showing our kids and our friends and our family what we value based on how we interact with wildlife. So are timber rattlesnakes worth any less than something like a white-tailed deer? Uh, that's all things that we have to debate with ourselves and figure out. So ultimately, stay informed, stay open-minded, and keep in mind that the timber rattlesnake story is applicable to all other species. Um, how we manage moose, for example, is a really hot topic right now. And I, I, I'll keep you know, things simple around that, but um, do your research and just know what you think uh, would work and what's best for our moose in Maine. Make informed opinions. And just to put this again in a scientific context, there was a study done back in the 70s where they wanted to know what made people like snakes more. So they gave different presentations to middle school audiences, and I, I think there were adults mixed in. But essentially, um, they tried doing what I'm doing now with a slideshow to see if it significantly changed attitudes, and it didn't. So I'm probably doing nothing important right now for you guys. Um, then they tried showing snakes to people while they talked about them. Also didn't work. They tried having people touch the snakes while they talked about them. 
also didn't work. And that's surprising because we hear so much about um, interacting with wildlife and having those experiences being what, um, you know, gets people excited about animals. But when we think about people like Steve Irwin or Jeff Corwin or like these uh, celebrities that really brought us into the natural world, um, it wasn't just the fact that they were interacting with the animals, which whether or not I um, approve of that depends on the context, but the modeling of good behavior is what really does it. Getting people excited, showing that you're excited and that you care about the species is really what made the difference in this study. Okay. So um, that's the end of everything. Hopefully you all stuck with me through it. Just as a recap, as some things that you can do for our herps here in Maine, you can participate in local citizen science projects. If you own any land, and I mean like even if you own less than an acre, there are things that you can do to improve your um, yard to make it better for herps. Um, and of course, we need to encourage ethical behavior of our friends and family, especially by modeling it. And please don't forget the little guys. So. Um, thank you so much. If you have asked questions, I will try to get to them. And if you want to ask me anything elsewhere, that's my email if you want to contact me. Um, so thanks a bunch, and I hope you all enjoyed. Thanks, Greg. Thank you. Hang so on a second. Let me get back in, in the box here. That was great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Hopefully, We have several questions. And I'd like to start with telling a little more about the big night. Could you give a, an idea of the date range when this is likely to occur? Yeah, so typically the um, biggest big night occurs right about April 20th here in Maine. Um, it's been like April 20th, April 21st the past couple of years. Um, but the migration season is really spread out throughout April. In fact, we had migrations occurring as early as like March 25th this past year. Um, anytime you have temperatures above 50 degrees Fahrenheit with rain, as long as the ground is uh, no longer frozen, you'll have movements. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, another related question, I think, if you know where the nesting site for, reg for eggs is, would it be prudent to simply remove the eggs, hatch them out, and then return the, the hatchlings to the same area near the pools? This is obviously to, pre to prevent predation. Mm. Um, I go back and forth on that. I try to uh, minimize my interaction with uh, things like that as much as possible, just because I'm, <laughs> I've had bad luck with things like that before. Um, but I, I I think especially in an educational setting, that's something that that's okay. Um, if you are noticing that vernal pools are drying up much faster than they should be, um, it seems all right to take the egg mass and place it into just a little tank of water. You wanna make sure that water is um, hopefully taken from that pool. Don't fill it up with sink water or tap water that could have heavy metals or chlorine. Um, and you want to keep it room temperature or less. If it's too warm, it can kill the eggs. Um, so you want it usually about like 50 degrees Fahrenheit, I think is the usual um, temperature. Um, I, so ultimately I advise just leaving them be if you can, but if uh, you do want to give it a shot, there are some special recommendations out there for it. Right. Where we have a question, do milk snakes live in our state? I think you, we covered, we touched on that. Yep, and they certainly do, and um, they're usually found closer to uh, civilization, it seems. They seem to benefit well from being closer to things like farms and buildings. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, I'd like to mention to everyone that uh, we did record the program tonight, and it will be available in a couple of days. You can access it either through the York County Audubon website or through our Facebook page. And I think we're good with questions for at this point. Actually, I have but, one if you fed out mine, if you want to jump in. Please. Uh, uh, Greg, I bought a house a couple of years ago with a, with a pool. Uh, mm -hmm. I uh, didn't, don't really want it, but here it is. And um, uh, uh, so when, when amphibians find swimming pools, are they, do they sort of stumble upon them thinking that they're a pond or they somehow, can they smell the water? And so I do keep it covered for as long as possible, well past April. But I'm, but I guess I'm concerned that they, you know, it's not like an airtight cover or anything. 
Um, so what can I do to, uh, I, I don't live in a, in a high traffic uh, amphibian area, but what can I do to keep them safe? So did you say it was above ground or in ground? It's in ground. Okay, so in ground is much uh, harder to deal with than above ground because above ground, luckily you have that barrier where most amphibians won't be climbing up. But um, when you have in ground, um, it's pretty difficult, I would say, to make sure no amphibians end up in there. Um, usually the cover is good enough. Um, yeah. When amphibians are migrating through, they don't want to um, go down into water. They want to usually be on a terrestrial space. Um, so hopefully that cover would be enough to deter anything that's migrating through. Um, and if you do end up getting that end up in your pool, there's um, little, I don't know if you've seen them before, like ladders. <laughs> yeah, we have, we have two of those. Oh, good. Yeah. So for any anyone who is not uh, familiar with them, um, they're little ladders. They're like this big as far as I know, right? And like you yep. put them on the side of your pool. So if anything falls in, they can climb out. Um, did that answer your question? I feel like I missed a mark somewhere. Yeah. And nope, that's it. Um, I uh, uh, Did they just sort of stumble upon the pool or do they somehow sense oh. that it's there? Yeah. So as far as I know, there's nothing sensory going on that's leading them to the pool. Uh, okay. As far as I know, it's just about their migration routes. They're stumbling upon it. Okay. Yeah, we, 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 I have not seen, I don't think any amphibians, but we did get, get quite a few rodents in the pool, shrews and things. <laughs> um, after we installed those little um, ramp ladder things, we, we never found another one afterwards. So um, Excellent. So they work well. So that's good. Good. Thanks. Well, I'm glad to hear they work. No problem. All right. Okay. Well, I'll just mention that also, uh, we have another program scheduled for the third Tuesday in November, uh, featuring a, and a tremendously experienced whale guide who will be talking about narwhals and all different species of whales. So it should be pretty neat. So check that out. It'll be uh, information will be on our website soon. And Greg, thank you very much for joining us. We hope to have yeah. you back sometime. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, guys. Okay, good night, everyone. Good night.